So we will have the open forum after the second presentation to be made to be made by myself. And the title of my paper is Assessing the Views on Enrique de Malacca, the first Southeast Asian to circumnavigate the world. When discussing the events of 1521 in the Philippines, the question that is often asked is how did Magellan communicate with the natives? The answer is that Magellan had a Malay interpreter whose name is Enrique de Malacca or Enrique of Malacca. Enrique has fascinated Filipinos, Malaysians, and to a lesser extent, it seems, um, the Indonesians. His reputation now ranges from a mere slave to a national hero, even from a myth to a legend. The objective of my short presentation is to assess the dominant views on Enrique de Malacca in the Philippines and Malaysia, and to compare them with Enrique in the primary sources. It is an effort to separate fact from fiction, and its goal is to view Enrique from the lens of history. In the Philippines, the popular knowledge of Enrique is based on the writings of Carlos Quirino, a Filipino national artist for historical literature. Quirino was the proponent of the idea that Enrique was a Filipino, as he wrote in an article, um, in the article, The First Man Around the World was a Filipino published in the Philippines Free Press on December 28, 1991. In his book, Who's Who in the Philippines, or Who's Who in Philippine History, rather, published in 1995, the same author wrote that Enrique was arguably the first man to circumnavigate the globe and added that he was born in Karkar, Cebu, circa 1493, and died at Cebu, circa 1563. He then went on to say that his early life is unknown, but he was said to be fishing off the coast of Cebu when he was captured by pirates and brought to the slave trade center of Malacca, the Portuguese colony of what is now Malaysia. Magellan purchased him because he came from an unheard of place, named him Enrique, then took him along to India, Africa, and Lisbon, Portugal. Before they left Spain on their voyage to the east, Magellan freed him as a slave, although Enrique did not know this. Then they traveled to Guam, then to Cebu, where Enrique witnessed the killing of his master by the Mactan chieftain Lapu-Lapu and decided he would not return to Spain as a slave. The new commander, Barbosa, ordered him to ask Raja Humabon for jewels to be presented to the king. Instead, he set the Spaniards up for a lunch with the local leader, at which they were slain. He proved useful to Humabon for his knowledge of Spanish and Portuguese. He must have married, raised a family, and passed away in his 70s, just before Legaspi arrived. Unfortunately, Quirino never mentions his sources, and he portrays Enrique as a local boy who eventually returns home, and in doing so, just becomes the first man to circumnavigate the world. So there's no agency involved. Okay? He, it was simply the circumstances that made him okay, accomplish that tremendous feat. Now, the narrative is designed to assert two points. First, that Enrique was a Filipino. And second, that he was the first to circumnavigate the world. So again, unfortunately, these claims are unsubstantiated, and thus many details in his narrative are purely imaginary. While the earlier article may be acceptable as a work of literature, his having included the above-stated biography in his book, Who's Who in Philippine History, gave it a semblance of historical legitimacy. And before long, the story of Enrique, the Filipino who was the first to circumnavigate the world, made its way into some classrooms. The fictional Enrique was thus portrayed as a historical Enrique, and hence the creation of, well, it's more of a myth than a legend, unfortunately. Okay. Now, in Malaysia, the popular knowledge of Enrique is based on the novel Panglima Awang. Harun Aminur Rashid's post-colonial novel written in 1957, Professor Ahmad Murad Merikan, provides a summary of Panglima Awang in his book, Revisiting Atas Angin, 
a review of the Malay imagination of Rum, Feringhi, and the Penjaja. Okay, because uh, well, as far as I know, Panglima Awa has not been formally translated to English. Now, basically, the story goes, and based on the summary by Professor Murad, Malacca uh, had been conquered by Albuquerque and was treacherously aided by foreign merchants within the city. So the Sultan fled, and Enrique, who was known as Panglima Awang or Commander Awang, leads a small guerrilla band fights on but is captured in a raid on a Portuguese ship and then taken to Goa to be sold as a slave in Portugal. Magellan, the ship's captain, comes to respect Awang and buys him from Albuquerque and then names him Enrique and makes him his personal assistant. In Portugal, he is warmly received as a member of Magellan's family. Magellan's sister even falls in love with him, but he remains faithful Okay, to Tungaya, his fiance, whom he left behind in Malacca. So the basic story goes on where um, uh, Magellan moves from the Portuguese court to the Spanish court and eventually receives his uh, blessings to cross the Atlantic onwards to the Pacific. And uh, basic, the basic story of how he played a significant role in uh, uh, forging an, a friendship with the king of Cebu in particular is mentioned. Okay, and then yes, uh, after that the the death of Magellan and then the uh, the the, uh, the 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 meal where there was a massacre. Okay, and uh, basically Awang informs the king of the uh, evil intentions of the Spaniards after Magellan was killed, and uh, a surprise attack on the Spanish fleet. Uh, kills the man who replaced Magellan, who was Barbosa. So Awang returns to, okay, so he says that uh, Enrique returns to Melaka on a Siamese ship. And along the way, Awang's men seize the ship. Having reunited with his comrades, he then sails with them to Johor and continues overland to Moir to learn more about the resistance against the Portuguese. He finds out that his fiance has become a leader of a guerrilla band and happily reunited, they marry and set out for Pahang to find the Sultan and continue the struggle to restore Malacca to him. So the novel transforms Enrique from a Malay slave turned interpreter into a rebel fighter and a hero of his people. According to Professor Murad, the novel may be read as representing the West or the Malay image of the Feringi or the Portuguese and other Western foreigners. He then provides an excellent discussion of the symbolism, meaning, and other uh, relevance of the novel. But what's interesting is that much of the details mentioned in Panglima Awang, again, is not based on primary sources. I'm sorry, uh, this is uh, Harun Amin um, Rashid, okay, the author of Panglima Awang. So who was Enrique? What do the historical sources say about him? There are three documents that provide background information on Enrique de Malacca. The best known is Antonio Pigafetta's Primo Viaggio in Torno al Mondo, where Enrique is simply identified as of Sumatran origin. Antonio Pigafetta was a young Italian who joined the Magellan Elcano expedition as a volunteer. He took on the task of rec recording the events of the trip, thus producing the longest and most valuable narrative of the voyage. He was among the few who were fortunate to return to Spain in the year 1522, thus being one of the first to circumnavigate the world. The value of his narrative to historians is that it is an eyewitness account, the ideal primary source. And he was also personally acquainted with Enrique, so he knew him personally. The second source is the Molucci's Insulis by Maximilianus Transilvanus, who said that Enrique was born in the Moluccas and whom Magellan bought in Malacca. Unlike Pigafetta, he was not part of the voyage, I'm referring to Transilvanus. Nonetheless, he published the earliest account on the Magellan Elcano expedition 
using information gathered from interviews with the survivors of the expedition, including Sebastian Alcano, the commander of the ship that made it back. So his methodology would be equivalent to oral history today. The third source is the last will and testament of Ferdinand Magellan. Magellan was the master of Enrique who led the Armada de Maluco on its voyage to circumnavigate the world until he met his fate in the Philippines in 1521. The will was executed by the great explorer at Sevilla, Spain on August 24, 1519, about a month prior to his voyage for the New World. And the portion of the will that uh, concerns Enrique states the following. By the way, uh, that document was, uh, I think it is being restored in Spain, and that is a photograph, okay, that, that uh, which you see on the screen. So the document states, and by this my present will and statement, I declare and ordain as free and quit of every obligation of captivity, subjection, and slavery, my captured slave Enrique Mulato, native of the city of Malacca, of the age of 26 years more or less, that from the day of my death thenceforward forever, the said Enrique may be free and manumitted and quit exempt and relieved of every obligation of slavery and subjugation that he may act as he desires and thinks fit. And I desire that of my estate, there may be given to the said Enrique the sum of 10,000 maravedis in money for his support and this manumission I grant because he is a Christian and that he may pray to God for my soul. Of the three documents, the will is the shortest, but it provides the greatest amount of detail on the background of Enrique. The will also reveals the following key information regarding his identity his status, race, origin, age, and his religion. Contrary to the Transylvanus account, it states that Enrique was captured and not purchased by Magellan. Capturing the enemy and making him a slave used to be a normal part of warfare anywhere in the world. And one may speculate that Magellan captured Enrique during the Portuguese conquest of Malacca. Also, if Enrique was estimated to be 26 years old in 1519, he would have been around 18 years old um, during the conquest in 1511, old enough to be a soldier. The document also describes Enrique as a mulatto. Mulatto is a racial category used in the Spanish empire to refer to people of mixed race with African ancestry. This appears to be the basis of Enrique's other moniker, Enrique the Black or Black Henry. It is quite intriguing that Enrique was described as a mulatto, for it suggests that he had black skin or even that he was of African ancestry. However, it must be taken into consideration that racial categories have been constantly redefined and can thus mean different things at different times. It may be worth noting that in the narration of uh, Esteban Rodriguez on the voyage and conquest um, uh, of the Philippines by Miguel Lopez de Legazpi, he described Filipino women they encountered as having good brownish mulatto features. The word mulatto as used by Magellan should thus not be understood in the strict sense, okay, today in the context of his time, by calling him mulatto, Magellan simply described Enrique as a man with dark skin, which is typical of the Malay race, or the biological, okay, in the biological sense. Now, as mentioned earlier, both Antonio Pigafetta and Maxima Maximilianus Transilvanus pointed to Indonesia as Enrique's place of origin, his place of birth. However, Magellan in his last will and testament described his slave as a native of the city of Malacca. This means that by contemporary standards, Enrique would be Malaysian. This was the statement made on a legal, legal document from a man who presumably knew Enrique best, 
The idea of Enrique's Indonesian origin may thus have been an error committed by Pigafetta and Trans Transilvanus. While Pigafetta wrote the essential record of events and, uh, that transpired during the first circumnavigation and was also personally acquainted with Enrique, knowledge of his background could not have been as extensive as Magellan's, who knew him for a much longer period. It is unfortunate that he didn't mention why he said that Enrique was Sumatran and where he derived the information. Transilvanus, on the other hand, never met Enrique. What he knew about him was a secondhand information derived from those he interviewed. He may thus have concluded that Enrique originated from the Moluccas because of his ability to speak the language of the islands. Indeed, it was the moment when Enrique communicated with the natives that Magellan and his crew realized, that's when they confirmed that they had succeeded in their mission of reaching the Far East by sailing westward. It thus appears that Transilvanus, or his source, simply assumed Enrique's place of origin because of the language that he spoke. Among the three historical documents, Magellan's last will and testament should be regarded as the most reliable of Enrique's origin for several reasons. First, it is a legal document made under oath, which increases the likelihood of its truthfulness and accuracy. Second, it came from a person who was most familiar with him being his longtime master. Third, it was drafted before the journey to the Spice Islands, making it untainted with the events of the voyage. Thus, based on the last will and testament, it can be stated that the historical records favors the argument that Enrique was truly from present-day Malaysia. The final detail is that Enrique was a Christian. Now, there's no record on what religion he practiced prior to converting or even if he converted at all. His conversion shall therefore remain speculative. Nonetheless, the probability that he was a convert is high because the Iberians were known to have carried the zeal of converting others to their religion um, as, as stated in many studies. Okay, the missionary zeal was part of the Spanish mission and the conversion was part of the, um, of the objectives. And uh, well, just like Spain, Portugal was also part of the Reconquista and looking at the accounts, Magellan was affected by the same zeal. So this could have motivated him to convert Enrique to Christianity if it, it had been necessary. So the complete story of Enrique de Malacca will never be known, but the people of the Malay archipelago will remember him as the Malay man who participated in one of the greatest voyages of all time, the expedition that proved that the world is round. There's no historical evidence that Enrique completed the circumnavigation, but his significant role in the mission cannot be denied. The most important is that moment when Enrique successfully communicated with Filipinos, which proved that they, had that they had reached Southeast Asia by sailing the opposite direction. Okay, so it was certainly a moment in world history okay, that is uh, very important. And the Southeast Asian, particularly from the Dunya Melayu, uh, um, made it possible. So while we may call Enrique as the Malay world's original uh, international man of mystery, okay? I think that uh, the Dunya Melayu or Nusantara can claim him okay, to some extent as a common symbol of uh, the people. So the uh, stories of Quirino and um, uh, uh, in the novel of um, Panglima Awang, uh, basically uh, expresses okay, the post-colonial uh, reaction of the people in the region to take control of their narrative. It is a recognition of a Southeast Asian's place in history, in world history. Okay? Evidence that we were around and it, that we had a role to play. So with that, um, I think it would be appropriate to also call Enrique, not just Enrique de Malacca, as Enrique, but as Enrique de Dunia Melayu. And thank you very much. So now we proceed to the open forum.
So we have a raised hand from Nonya Tonko, and we will begin with uh, her question. So you may now unmute your microphone. Uh, the sources mentioned are the last will and testament, Maximilus Transylvanus Pigofeta. Any possibility that there could still be unearthed sources or any secondary? Because in my graduate studies, I recall reading, uh, I don't know if it was a doctoral study or something, uh, but this was uh, pre pre martial law there was no mention of uh, there was no mention of enrique so that means that the, these materials were not yet accessible yes well there are other sources but the ones that i used are the ones that are closest to the event there's an extensive biography written by don martin fernandez de navarrete written in 1837 which i find to be the uh, most reliable uh, secondary source but then it is a secondary source. So mm -hmm. I prioritized the primary sources that I considered most reliable. So these primary sources, are, are around what time did they, did they become accessible? Well, um, as, as far as Pigafetta uh, was concerned, almost immediately after his return to Spain. But it was not yet translated. Oh, no, no. And the, the original book was written in French. Oh, okay. I'm not sure about when it was translated to English. Okay, because um, yes, we have a comment from Professor Ahmad Murad Merikan. Okay, the author I cited earlier. He's with us today. Popular knowledge of Enrique in Malaysia called him Panglima Awang or Panglima Hitam. Panglima means warrior in Malay, and Hitam means black. Harun Aminur Rashid's novel Panglima Awang renders itself as a historical novel written in the mid-1950s. Now, from a comment from uh, Michael uh, Shaochua, when Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamed said that Enrique was Panglima Awang, a Filipino historian thought this as accurate and funny thing. The conjecture was that Panglima Awang is a Filipino term, therefore Enrique was a Filipino. Thanks for clarifying the life of Enrique. Well, I, I just want to comment about that, uh, uh, Mr. Chua. Uh, Prime Minister Mahathir actually stated that Enrique was a Filipino when he delivered a speech in late 1991 in South America. So it was a United Nations event. And in his speech, he, he basically stated that uh, the Prime Minister of Malaysia basically stated that contacts between the Malays and South America began okay, during the Magellan expedition when Enrique de Malacca, a captured slave from the Philippines, joined the Magellan expedition. So that story okay, of uh, Enrique being a Filipino was derived uh, well, uh, partly from that speech of Prime Minister Mahathir. Now, I haven't found the exact date of uh, that speech, but Carlos Quirino published the article I mentioned earlier on December 28, 1991. So it was in the same year. I'm just not sure if it was before or after the uh, speech of Prime Minister Mahathir. Now, um, we have so many questions. Um, Okay, so I'm, I'm sorry, I have to select through the questions pouring in, but we have a question from Feliz Noel Rodriguez. Did you look at the original will and testament or only the English translation? Um, well, what I used was the English translation because the original will is not accessible. So the um, translation, I'm sorry. Uh, the translation I used comes from Francis Henry H. Guillemard, Magellan's Wills, The Life of Ferdinand Magellan and the First Circumnavigation of the Globe, 1480 to 1521, published in 1890. 
Okay, so well, mainly because I didn't have access to the will. But the other documents, I read the original Spanish versions. I'm sorry, uh, the, the original versions. Okay. So another comment from um, Professor Murad. Panglima, panglima is a Malay term, variations of which are used throughout the Malay archipelago. From Professor Ambeth Ocampo, I think Navarrete has been translated and annotated by J.S. Cummins for the Hakiluyot Society, and Cummins also translated Morga. Um, a question, will, be, will sources of external and internal criticisms in readings in Philippine history? Um, okay. Oh, yes. Uh, uh, Dr. Jose Victor, Professor Jose Victor Torres wants to ask a question. So, so I'll turn on his microphone. Afterwards, uh, Mr. Filimon Hunterreal. Professor Torres. Hi, uh, Dr. Santiago. Can, can, can I be heard? I can hear you. Okay. Dr. Santiago, no, I, I already posted a question, but I'd like to explain it. No? Um, and it's probably also related to the, um, the question of uh, Dr. Feliz Rodriguez, because um, um, I'd like probably to know if the, the document would be accessible soon, no? but was actually written in the... Um, in the description of uh, Enrique, you know, because we, we've all accepted that it's a slave and everything that they're being referred to. But one of the things that I found strange, you know, because here you have someone who will accompany a journey going back to the place where he came from. And he, if he was captured, if he was arrested, if he was bought or anything, um, after so many years of leaving an area, and all of a sudden you have this opportunity now to arrive home to, to go home, no? Um, why didn't he ex exactly flee from the from the from the expedition when they arrived in the Philippines? No? Um, my my assumption is, and this is just a this is just pure assumption, was that Enrique was probably just more of a quote unquote slave, but probably a trusted um, a trusted uh, part, a trusted part of um, let's say a, a trusted um, aide of Magellan with regards to the um with regards to the uh going to of course to the uh, Molucas no um, many said he was an interpreter so that, I think that was one of the misconceptions that he was Filipino because he understood Visayan that was the um the language before no and um the, the for me the puzzle exactly fits because when he uh, eventually was um about to be quote unquote set free no um because of the death of Magellan, he took offense no, when Barbosa, I think, insulted him. And um, he, this was suddenly his opportunity now to, to be free, but suddenly it's being taken away from him. So justified the, just, the, the, the anger was justified. No? So, so going back again to the, to, my, uh, to the assumption, I want to, to ask you this, so probably we can look at it with regards to Enrique's life. Could he have been more of a a slave, but more of a trusted um, servant or someone who uh, Magellan would eventually, um, you know, um, ask advice from or something. Because I think he was the only one. He may have been one of those who knew that they were about to go to the Molucas. No, because Magellan would would have just have dragged him along, you no, know, for 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 fun or become become his servant uh, to just to serve him. Yeah, 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 that's my, that's my question. Okay, so based on all the uh, sources that I was able to, uh, to assess, uh, it seems that Magellan treated Enrique very well. Mm. Okay, so the, the notion that they may have been actually more than just master and slave, but real friends is a probability. But it's also very clear that Enrique was aware that after crossing the Pacific, okay, and upon Magellan's death, uh, he would be set free. And that's why after that uh, fateful encounter in Mactan, uh, well, if you, you've read the account, okay, I know, 
uh, but en Enrique seemed to have suffered from some form of trauma. So he was just, he, he was, uh, I think, bundled up in a blanket and re was refusing to work. And that was what made Barbosa very angry. So his refusal to act as an interpreter for the crew, okay, made Barbosa angry to the point that he told Enrique, that he, I think he called him a dog, okay, and then told him that you're not getting your freedom. And that is what supposedly irked Enrique. So that's what made him angry that he supposedly decided to um, uh, form that uh, conspiracy with the chief of Cebu. So um, my take on that is that Enrique, uh, well, again, this is a speculation, but the promise of freedom can be greater than, you know, just the promise of getting home. Now, uh, Enrique didn't speak Cebuano, okay? So he spoke Malay, and that's why he could, he could only speak to the chieftains of Homonhon and, uh, and Cebu. Okay, so, so the idea that uh, Enrique was a Cebuano because he could speak to the people in the Visayas has no basis. I hope I addressed your question, Dr. Torres. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, so there are so many other questions, but unfortunately, it's 1229, and the next session will begin at 1 p.m. We only have a 30-minute break because we have a total of 14 papers to be presented today. And so I'm really sorry that I will not be able to accommodate your questions, and uh, you cannot also ask them to Professor Doblado. But we will be happy to share our email addresses. Just please get in touch with the um, uh, organizers through pha2020conference at gmail.com. And we'll be very happy to address your uh, questions and concerns.